que el profesor Mintro tiene algunas características especiales. Por de pronto, él no es americano, sino que es alemán. Es un alemán que fue a enseñar a Estados Unidos. Y por lo tanto, ahí tuvo que aprender el idioma, hizo clases, hizo clases en el aula, en los colegios reales, y después empezó su carrera académica. Pero entonces, una segunda característica que no todos los investigadores es cierto tenemos, es que él ha sido efectivamente docente, ha vivido en escuelas y disfruta muchísimo de eso. Y en la actualidad, él, aparte de su labor de investigación, dirige un programa muy importante sobre el liderazgo educativo, que es un liderazgo que se lo canalizan y lo focalizan intentando no solo trabajar con directores de escuela, sino trabajar con administradores de distrito, es decir, trabajar con este nivel intermedio, que es tan importante y sin embargo hay tan poca formación. Y él ha desarrollado ya una experiencia larga desde su programa trabajando con esta capa. Lo que vamos a tener hoy día de parte del profesor Mintro va a ser una exposición que él ha denominado Incentivos Extrínsecos, Interés Personal y Compromiso con los Estudiantes y la Sociedad. ¿Puede el Homo Economicus cumplir con un trabajo de alta calidad en educación? Esa es la pregunta que él nos va a intentar responder. Vamos a tener la exposición del profesor Mintrop y después vamos a tener la posibilidad de tener algunas preguntas también. Profesor. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference and thank you very much for turning up for uh, my humble talk here today. I wish I could continue the conversation the way Jose started it in Spanish pero no puedo. <laughs> so I will continue uh, in English uh, and jump right in. My talk today is about one of the most important topics that we have in education today from my point of view. It also happens to be my area of research. Um, that topic is teacher or educator work motivation. The importance of that problem has been recognized by policymakers, by managers, by principals, and by teachers themselves. And it has been reflected in a number of experiments at the policy level, at the uh, organizational management level, and at the classroom level with how to motivate educators. Some people say, we need to develop schools as professional learning communities in which shared norms and values and commitments bolster teachers' love for children, love for craft and knowledge, and concern for, uh, for the society, community, and the common good. Others say, no, we need to appeal to self-interest with incentives such as high-stakes accountability or pay-for-performance. Some say we need to do both. I happen to be in this camp. I am currently involved in a pay-for-performance design development study in which we try to do both, try to find ways to incentivize teacher motivation and at the same time deliver on good educational practices. I will not talk about the details of this design study. This would be boring since Chile is very different from the United States. But instead, I want to share with you the preliminary base assumptions that are guiding my thinking or our thinking about a good pay for performance design. Before I continue, I would like to acknowledge Miguel Ordenes, who is in the audience right here, who is a collaborator on this particular project at the University of California, Berkeley, who is also here in Santiago to make me feel at home. <laughs> But other people have tried to do this as well. To begin with, we need a workable definition of high quality. Traditionally, economic utility is only one, albeit a major, criterion of goodness for high quality. But that competes with nurturance, democratic citizenship, personality development in the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty if we go to the classical uh, ideals of education that the Germans call Bildung, but also liberation or liberal arts as it is reflected in, in uh, American um, philosophies. I do not want to go into the usual ideological arguments that attach themselves to these kinds of conceptions. 
for my or for our project, I want to actually proceed with a more minimal uh, definition of quality. This minimal uh, definition of educational quality starts from the assumption that education is not, or good instruction, is not just about uh, simple, repetitive drill and practice of basic literacy and numeracy, but for which we then would uh, advocate a conception of work that is more routine, but that it is oriented towards uh, what uh, Fred Newman calls academic engagement of students. And when we have a conception of academic engagement of students, we need to acknowledge that educators' work is complex, uncertain, and interpersonal. And if we have that kind of definition, we need to be clear that, as it says here, educators, no matter what, unless we make it highly prescriptive, have wide discretion on how to divide their effort between their own welfare and the welfare of their students. It is their discretion. So these conceptions of high quality seem to uh, require, at least even in the minimalist version, a type of educator who is strongly capable of other regarding motives in his or her work. Motives that at the core benefit the welfare of students or the society as at large. Something akin but not quite a vocation. This seems antithetical to calculative, self-interested behavior that puts educators' egotistical self-regard front and center. But is it? That's the question of my talk that I want to explore with the help of the literature on economic exchange relationships, work motivation theory, public management. Then I take examples from, edu uh, from educational accountability in the United States and end up with some little smattering of public philosophy. Now, you can tell this is far too much for 45 minutes, so not everything will be covered in detail. And I should also say, when I say economic exchange relationships, you will hear this a little later, this is a field that is not mine. This is a field that I am fascinated by. So if there are economists in the room, you will notice this right away. I'll, I'll draw from this literature, but I'm not an expert in this literature, but I find it fascinating what economists uh, have found, and it, it informs my way of thinking about pay for performance. So I bracket my expertise in this way. I'm an educational researcher who is oriented towards problem solving, practical problems of the day. Okay. Quickly, what are incentives? Incentives are reward expectations that motivate work behavior through anticipated pleasure or satisfaction. So something needs to be at the end that the incentives dangle in front of you. All organizations, be they private or public, employ incentives to shape employees' willingness to exert effort towards the organizational goals. Incentives, this is important, produce voluntary action. They are not coercive. So if you, for example, have somebody running through the classroom that checks up on you every day, that is not an incentive, that is a control. An incentive motivates people to do the things that the organization wants people to do. Incentives can appeal to extrinsic motives, such as monetary reward, prestige, and career status, or intrinsic motives, such as satisfaction with one's work or expectations of self. They can be sharp, explicit, and high stakes. For example, uh, an accountability performance score or an evaluation score that one needs to reach or they can be fuzzy and implicit and somewhat low stakes. For example, a wage that is paid for show, showing up. Nobody would show for work if we wouldn't be paid. That's one of those fuzzy incentives that all organizations dangle. Okay? Now, appealing to workers' self-interest with extrinsic incentives for the purpose of motivating high performance is desirable from the point of view of the standard economic model. There again, as I said, I'm now moving into an area where I have limited expertise, but a lot of fascination. Okay? Models drawing from notions of economic man, such as principal agent theories, for example, assume that among the many motives that workers may have when they engage in their work, calculative utility maximizing 
based on their individual preferences is the most powerful one. So they don't say, these models don't say, well, people have only that motive. No, they don't say that. They say that's the most powerful motive that organizations need to exploit. Okay? The employer wants employees maximal effort for minimal wage. The employee in that logic wants to give minimal effort for maximal wage. That's a goal conflict. This goal conflict, according to principal agent models, realistic that it is, uh, makes them assume, makes this particular theory assume, that if employees left up to themselves, so to speak, employees will shirk effort, avoid risk, and withhold information. They'll try to shield themselves from employers. Employers, in other words, if we let them, they will free ride. Employers can prevent these behaviors with better information systems, uh, prescribing routine work, or measuring outcomes to motivate work. Now, in these kinds of models, there is no contradiction between educators' self-interest and the common good. And that is because well-designed incentive structures will constrain individuals to act according to socially desirable outcomes. So for example, if we have a particular incentive design that says, educators, you ought to increase test scores, that benefits society as well. So there is somewhat like the invisible hand in the times of Adam Smith, just like the butchers and bakers in those days, educators in working towards higher, higher test scores benefit society. Now if we could come up with this miraculous design, we wouldn't have to talk any further, but we're not entirely sure that we will be able to actually come up with this kind of design. And I have not seen a design such as this anywhere played out where, what, where I have studied. So if we cannot find this miraculous design, we need to rely on commitments. Now what are commitments? Marcia Sen, who is an economist uh, early on, defined commitments as the possibility that we as individuals would choose an action that benefits others when we have the choice to benefit ourselves. So commitments are something about other regard as opposed to self-regard. Okay. Uh, now, what would compel individuals choose other regarding action over self-regarding ones? That is a big question. Now, the, the answer of classical sociology, in line with Durkheim or Parsons, but also Freudian-inspired psychology, is institutions. Institutions socialize us into values, norms, obligations, routines, rituals, and the like that we internalize by identification with caregivers, but also identification with groups that we feel a sense of belonging to, and through persuasion, indoctrination, formal education, and the like. Institutions don't just shape up us cognitively, they shape us emotionally as well with shame and guilt when we violate norms that we consider valid. Now, homo sociologicus, or socialized man, coming from Durkheim and Parsons, have fallen out of favor. In our modern world, we rarely encounter people like my mother anymore, who when asked by her young son, mom, what is happiness? Answered in this characteristic, uh, with these characteristic words, happiness, my son, is being able to do one's duty without too much suffering. <laughs> now you can tell my mother was German. She was, not, she was not American and the pursuit of happiness was not enshrined in our constitution. So, Nowadays, modern society presumably offers us many more choices and has moved the guideposts away from eudaimonic conceptions of happiness to hedonistic ones. So the idea of knowledgeable, uh, self-reflective actor, to pick a more contemporary, uh, broad assumption of, of, of man or woman, uh, that of Giddens, uh, who negotiate their action space by reflecting on the rules that are swirling around and availing themselves of the resources that are in the, in, uh, in the action space and kind of thinking about, okay, what is appropriate behavior in all of that, meaning the norms, seems to be a lot more appealing. And if this is the more appropriate image of man, shouldn't we assume that in the world of work, 
particularly where we exchange economic goods, Durkheimian homo sociologicals or the socialized individual is hopelessly anachronistic. I believe that one does not need to be an old style Parsonian to refute this somewhat dim view of commitment to others. In the last 15 or 20 years, a line of empirical research in the midst of microeconomics and game theory arose that in my reading illuminates the power of commitments, even in situations that would suggest unbridled self-interest. Scholars such as Gintis or Fair in the German Spurking world have experimented with, uh, with various games called dictator game, ultimator game, public goods game, and the like. Um, I don't want to go into the details of all of this. I find this fascinating material. Uh, I can't say that I have totally um, uh, understood all of it yet, but what I understand I find, uh, very, like I said, very interesting. So, let me just tell you uh, how I read this literature and how I use this literature to make sense of what my challenge is, which is designing a pay-for-performance system that does all the miracles that we hope it will do. Okay? So if somebody in the room would give me 10,000 pesos and ask me to share it with, let's say, the woman in the first row, right here, a stranger I do not know, okay? this stranger has absolutely no recourse on my decision on how I will share. If I was totally self-interested, I would give one peso to that stranger and I would keep all the rest. Is this what ordinarily happens in these experiments? No. In most instances, people give between 20 and 60 percent. They are not asked, they cannot be, be uh, uh, sanctioned, they give between 20 and 60 percent. Now let's assume this stranger has the ability to reject the offer. But if she rejects the offer, she won't get anything. Now, a purely self-interested actor would, of course, take the one peso. Because if she rejects the one peso, she won't get anything. This is not the way it works. Unless it is at least 20 to 30 percent of the amount offered to the person, the person will, more likely than not, reject the offer. Now, why is that? In another type of experiment, Employment relationships are modeled in exchange between A, who pays a fixed wage out of a pool of money, and B, who subsequently indicates the level of effort she is willing to put out in return for the wage. A has no way of enforcing B's effort once the wage has been paid. If we were purely self-interested, these are all experiments, hundreds of experiments done in many, many different countries, so there is no indication that it wouldn't apply to Chile though I have not seen Chile in the list of the countries where those experiments have been made, but I wouldn't be surprised if they have, um, given how strong the economic... Uh, uh, no, I'm not going there. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so in, in the logic of self-interest, A would pay very little and B would keep his effort down to a minimum. But that's not the way the pattern comes out. The pattern comes out is that B often, quite, quite often, offers a commensurate effort to what he thinks or she thinks is a fair wage. Okay? Uh, so what is in revealing in all of these exchanges uh, is that participants are heterogeneous. Not everybody acts on a logic of trust or fairness. About a third of the people that participate in these experiments act selfishly no matter what. They will always find the self-interested calculus and they're always, if we take the evidence from these experiments, they will always be with us. And then there are others that are so-called reciprocators that act on a logic of trust. Now it's important to keep in mind that this conception of, of reciprocation is not akin to the tit-for-tat reciprocation fee that you charge to American citizens when we cross the border. That is a tit for tat, okay? This reciprocation is a matter of assuming in the logic of trust that somebody will come up with a fair treatment in return for, for fair effort. Now, reciprocators are not pure altruists, as those uh, experiments found. In public good games, we find, let me just briefly say how they work, okay? In the public good game, you have a bunch of people and they can invest in the public good. 
when the majority of the people invest in the public good, everybody gains more than they had uh, at the beginning of the game. If the majority of the people free ride, the people that invest incur a penalty. In this kind of situation, self-interest would dictate nobody invests, invests in the public good, uh, everybody keeps their money. This is not the way it works in hundreds of experiments. The way it works, the way it works, the way it works, <laughs> the way it works is, is like this. Okay. Uh, when you start the experiment, you have a, a, a quite a number of people who cooperate who act as reciprocators in the beginning, but as the experiment iter goes through various iterations, the reciprocators realize, oh, there are free riders, and with more free riders, I'm losing out. So in the end, everybody will be self-interested. But when you add, this is very interesting, when you add the possibility that the reciprocators can punish the free riders, but here's the trick in this game. The punishment is an altruistic punishment, not a self-interested punishment, in that it costs the punisher a chunk of money, in this case, to, to punish. A very different pattern arises. In the end, most everybody will become a cooperator or will invest in the public good, keeping in mind that the reciprocators are now using their resources for them the desire to, public, uh, to punish the ones who violate norms of fairness is stronger than their own self-interest. Okay? Now, why is this all important? Well, it seems to me that when we talk about pay for performance, we need to be clear what kind of human being we're actually having in front of us. And here are the base assumptions that I that guide my work or our work in, in this particular project. If we assume that good education cannot be had with a, with, without a sizable degree of empathy, altruism, commitment to craft, and commitment to the common good, then we can, opt, can be optimistic when we look at these kinds of games. Human beings, even in situations that encourage unbridled self-interest in those games, for example, show they're not egotists by nature. Employment situations even are imbued with moral sentiment of fairness and can be arranged according to these principles. Nuances, however, of organizational design, the punishment option, for example, the right or wrong kinds of incentives and sanctions may have a powerful effect on the survival of other regarding social commitments. Self-interest is very powerful, needs to be dealt with. We can't ignore it. All employment relationships are driven by self-interest, but this is what I gained from, from this literature. Social commitments are the more fragile good to be protected. So when we do these kinds of experiments, this is the, this is the principle we need to keep in mind. Now, evidence from games and theories don't help us solve problems. We need to actually go into the real world of educational management, and I want to do this right now. Okay. Um, we have an older uh, public management approach, which probably was prevalent in Chile until the 80s, perhaps 90s, I do not know. It is still very, very prevalent in Germany, for example, where we have a stable civil servant kind of career pattern and a newer public management approach that banks on pay for performance and accountability and the like. You're familiar with all of this here in, in, in Chile. Uh, in fact, on four and a half days, I have found that you have a, for a social scientist, wonderfully complex system that has just about all of the elements mixed up in some ways. Uh, so it's, 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 like I said, for a social scientist, a wonderful laboratory, but nobody likes to live in a laboratory. So. Um, anyway, so, uh, now if we had uh, incontrovertible empirical evidence that one management system was superior over the other, we could stop talking right now. But we don't. When you look at, and I'm just doing this in a very cursory way, when you look at, for example, PISA, that has been mentioned several times here, it seems to be just as important in Chile as it is in Germany, 
Um, it plays no role in the United States, um, interestingly. Um, if we look at PISA, for example, we have countries that have older public management, that function according to older public management systems, like Finland, that are doing really well. Um, and we have some that have recently improved quite a bit with, with OPM, older public management, such as Germany. But we have other examples that show oh, it's not working that well. When you look at newer public management systems, you look at uh, a country like the US, which with the high stakes accountability would now have to be counted under newer public management, it's stagnant. No, it's not stagnant, it's not doing all that well. When you look at England, that is definitely a country with a lot of new public management principles. I would say in recent, year, it's, recent years, it's stagnated, but it's had some good uh, increases at some point, but it looks stagnant right now when I look at the, the data. When you look at New Zealand, that looks, on the other hand, pretty good. So anyway, I don't want to make too much of this because you can't make a clear connection between a management system and an outcome. That's just about not possible. But, uh, but it nevertheless makes for an interesting debate since no side has clear empirical evidence on its side, at least uh, from what I can see. So very, very briefly, uh, what is older public management looking like? You, are, you may be all familiar with it, or it may have been already become so distant here in, in, in Chile. It is, the, the, if you will, the old public sector employee with uh, diploma-based entry requirements, high job security, flat career ladder, a salary scale based on seniority, weak supervision, and high membership in professional associations or unions. Um, the idea is that material disinterestedness, you get a wage, but you know, your, your, your wage is not dependent on your, your effort, and non-competitive collective orientations, and a strong normative commitment to students, society, and craft that is bolstered by institutions of higher learning and professional associations will do the job. Uh, professional autonomy is an important aspect in this kind of system. Uh, with autonomy, teachers are able to negotiate and find compromises uh, among the multiple and conflicting goals uh, and aims that society puts on schools. So it's rather opaque. High performance is the result of professional responsibility. What's important is a certain percentage of free riders is tolerated. If we, for example, look at the ones that are chronically sick, it's a huge problem uh, in Germany, you have in the big cities, you know, 10, 15 percent of the the, uh, the uh, employees uh, sick. That means, you know, the city uh, the city has to spend money on on these people that are now. Some of them are really sick. Some of them are not sick. The system has to somehow tolerate the free riders, and it does it in in some kind of bargain, so to speak. We give autonomy to the ones that are highly motivated, and we bite the bullet on the ones that free ride. Okay, that's kind of the way the system, uh, the system uh, used, to used to work or is still working in some of these systems. Okay? Now, there are extrinsic, in extrinsic incentives in this system as well that appeal to self-regard, but they are less visible. They're fuzzy, multiple, and low stakes. So work effort is expended, as I said, in return for stable and fair wage and other material benefits. Now, you have central exit exams in these kinds of systems as well, and you have instructional materials that give broad orientations for educators, but they are not directly involved in the employee's decision to highly perform. They're broad orientations, okay? Now, self-interested motives uh, also have a very negative aspect in older public management systems. That is, in older public management systems, teachers have strong associational collective power that allows them to extract resources from society, not in return for higher effort, but for the purpose of furthering their own labor welfare. If this is taken too far, Educators will garner resources from society for their own welfare and benefit that is lacking for students. So the dividing line between educational uh, labor welfare and welfare of students is corrupted, so to speak. That is a problem of older public management systems. Okay? Short of gross violations of duties, there's little management can do to prevent shirking. 
internalized obligations, standards of work quality, deeply attached to one's self-concept as a professional, and social pressure from colleagues would have to temper detrimental self-interested orientations towards workers' comfort and well-being. Basically, in older public management, high performance is a matter of professional responsibility and the willingness of teachers and principals to voluntarily restrain their self-interest, to play that self-interest out to the extreme that the associational power and the discretion and autonomy that they're allowed to have in that system would uh, enable them to play. So it is the voluntary restraint of self-interest. Now, is this management approach for which uh, is this a management approach for which too much hinges on the power of other regarding commitments? Are we assuming that educators are knights or angels? To go back to Hume, I don't think so. What has become clear to me is that older public management, I have to ask myself why it is working in a country like Germany, does not require educators to be knights or angels, but to act as employees that are able to restrain, not abdicate their self-interest and are willing to put out effort in return for, for a fair wage. Now, I think that this restraint is not a far-fetched idea, given how people in experimental games that, that uh, encourage unbridled self-interest act with norms of, of fairness. So there is hope, or there is a reason why these systems somewhat work. And that is perhaps the reason why many high-performing countries have these kinds of management systems. But this does not mean that newer public, management, uh, uh, um, newer public management principles could not work as well or better. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't do a design development study uh, that tries to, to model pay for performance. Now, newer public management, that is accountability, uh, pay for performance and the like, transforms the role of self-interest by pulling it away from labor welfare and attaching it, that is, you know, workers' comfort, well-being, wages, and the like, and attaching it to performance. We have a small number of, of quantitative indicators. You have rewards, sanctions, and the like. Workplace security is, is de-emphasized. You can be hired and fired. Uh, and unionization is strongly discouraged. This is at least the way it is in the United States and in some other countries that I have looked at. Okay? There can be little doubt that incentivizing self-interest is generally a powerful motivator in work settings. Self-interest is powerfully at play when employers and employees exchange wages against effort in experimental situations, and self-interest motives are pervasive in for-profit environments, and the literature on, on uh, teacher motivation shows that self-interest is an important component in, 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 motivation, in work motivation as well. But is, is this management approach a good fit for education? This is the question that I'm turning to right now. Now, for new public management systems, again, pay for performance, accountability, and the like, okay, systems to work, um, performance needs to be calculable. Because pay for performance systems only work if you can calculate a reward of, or if you have a clear goal that you can measure as attainable or whose attainability or whose, uh, who, you know, whose attainability you can actually judge. Okay? But here lies the problem in the field of education. The problem is not that one could not capture teacher performance in a number of performance indicators, standardized test scores, lesson evaluation, student parent satisfaction with surveys, attendance, disciplinary infractions, suspensions, a host of school climate measures, all of that could capture the quality of educators' work. The problem is that these indicators become distortive as economists such as Holstrom and Milgram and Baker and others, but also educational scholars such as Daniel Koretz call this effect when they tr are tied to self-interested reward calculations. It is in the nature of educational work that many of these indicators, there's hardly any, that many of these indicators are easily manipulated by workers. 
as they shift work effort to those aspects of the work that are measured to the detriment of those that are not. The effect is how the, the new public management literature calls this. The effect is that overall quality of the work goes down as measure quantities go up. The new PM, that the NPM literature discusses these effects as the disconnect between outputs and outcomes. Outputs go up when outcomes remain the same or actually go down. This effect is, a, is of course, one of those unintended side effects of, of the system, distortion. But distortion is only one drawback of relying on extrinsic incentives that appeal to self-interest. Another one discussed in the literature is the so-called crowding out effect of intrinsic motivation. A simple example from the world of pets may illustrate this. You go to the park on Sunday with a dog and a ball, and the dog is all excited about going. You're on the, in the park and you throw the ball and the dog runs, fetches the ball, comes back. You throw the ball again, the dog comes back. It's all excited. You can play this the game until the dog is tired, happily tired, and wants to go home. Next Sunday, you go again to the park, but you bring two dogs. And you bring a sausage. Ha. Okay. So you play the game again with the, with the one dog, like you did it the week and before. You throw the ball, and the dog runs and fetches the ball, comes back, and the tail is wagging and everything. Okay. Now you do the same thing with the second dog, but every time the second dog comes back, he, he gets a little piece of sausage. What will happen? After a few rounds, the first dog, who was very excited about the game the weekend before, stops playing. He sees that, oh, I'm not getting a sausage. You run out of sausage, and the second dog start, stops playing too. Neither dog is happy, nor, excited, not, nor uh, exhausted. So you have a lot of busy dogs at home. So this is, this is one of the crowding out effects of extrinsic incentives. Crowding out effects play a role in human motivation as well and they dis disrupt the straightforward relationship between extrinsic incentives and rewards on one hand and effort on the other. For example, in experimental games, again, FAIR and these kinds of people, most of this stuff comes out of Switzerland. You should not be surprised that they are trying to refute as much as they can in such a kind of communal society that the self-interest model um, is not the be-all and end-all, I think. Okay. Um, that under circumstances when employers have a hard time specifying and verifying performance, introducing sanctions for lower than expected performance actually decreases workers' effort relative to non-sanctions conditions. So the problem is that when workers begin to calculate their self-interest, they withhold effort that was given freely based on its intrinsic value such as interest in the work itself or social commitments. I'll give you an example of the United States. We are now telling educators that are, they are no longer idealists and they are no longer community activists. We're telling them you are there to put out high effort for a good wage, but we cannot pay them a professional wage. This is no problem in the middle class schools, but in the bottom of the heap, educators that are now self-calculating work and say, well, with this salary, with these working conditions, I'm not doing it, and they walk away. The organizational commitment that we have in these kinds of schools is abominable, with turnover rates of 50% per year. Um, I heard uh, the last few days that you have schools such as these as well. How can we compel educators with the paltry wages that we pay them in these schools if we appeal to their self-interest. That's kind of the conundrum. It hopefully can be done. But this is the conundrum we're dealing with, okay? Now, the crowding out, out hypothesis has also been found in self-determination theory. Uh, self-determination theory says that human beings act, work, according to their, their needs of autonomy, competence, and a sense of belonging. And to the degree that extrinsic incentives give employ employees the sense that they are not doing it in an internal locus, locus of control, but with an external locus of control, the, the energy related to the task itself diminishes. 
Now, the crowding out hypothesis, I have to say, has been hotly debated. There are lots of reviews, and you cannot say that that is a bona fide finding, quite the opposite. Okay? But what the debate has done is it requ has required researchers to look at the conditions under which crowding out or crowding in or additive and subtractive self-interest plus commitments occurs. Okay? So what the literature has found is that when extrinsic incentives are perceived as overly controlling, punitive, and attached to high pressure, a crowding out effect happens. That is, other regarding commitments diminish and people start thinking about themselves. Crowding in, that is, additive conditions seem to be indicated when extrinsic incentives are perceived as informative of competence, when they are symbolically cued as rewarding high performance, and when they are embedded in trusting relationships with supervisors. Okay. I'm told I have five minutes. Okay. So, where does this leave us? Clearly, work to a large extent is extrinsically motivated. We all work because we need the money. We are exposed to external regulations no matter what among them extrinsic incentives that appeal to our self-interest. Okay. For self-determination theory, the motivational effect of external regulations depends on the degree with which they enhance or diminish autonomy, competence, and a sense of belonging or relatedness of workers. And this depends on the degree we internalize these external regulations, whatever they may be. Now, for example, if we believe that uh, standardized tests is something that society wants us to do, we as educators will do it. This is what self-determination theory calls introjection. But there is a deeper form in, of internalization that is called integration, and that is what we, we ought to strive for. Regulations that we have integrated have become part of us. They radiate out to a larger complex of values, standards of qualities, and practices that are meaningful to us. When we look at our work in all of its varied facets through the lens of standardized tests embedded into these wider facets, we have integrated standardized tests into our work. That's kind of the idea. Okay. In sum, if educational work is one of those lines of work that attracts a relatively high percentage of reciprocators, which is what we can assume, that gives employees wide and unverifiable discretion in how they want to expend their effort, and that requires a good dose of other regarding commitments and enjoyment in craft, incentivizing self-interest needs to be done with great caution. So when we look at, when we compare older public management with newer public management, we find an, an, an interesting confluence. In older public management, we had to find a way, or educators or systems had to find a way for professionals to self-restrain on their self-interest. In newer public management systems, we have the same problem. Because if we let self-interest run rampant or if we create designs in which self-interest crowds out other commitments, we incur distortions of educational quality that we do not want. So, I've, I've had plenty of uh, empirical evidence from the United States that shows that particular designs uh, produce distortion and crowding out effects. I just want to show you one. And that is this, I've showed this before, I actually show this all the time it, to my students in my classes. When they talk about standardized tests, I always go like this. <laughs> this is the high stakes test, this is the low stakes test. This is your sim set when you make it high stakes. This is, if you are, if you are uh, unlucky, PISA. If you're lucky, it's like this. If you have it like that, PISA and sim set, you've done something right. If you can't get PISA up, but you get sim set up, you know that you have a distortion effect, and you know that you've had a crowding out effect. So, you know, for the next few years, we'll see it. The devil is in the detail. It's, of course, these are theoretical musings of principles that we ought to take into consideration. It depends on the specific design. The high stakes accountability design in the United States, let me show you the next one real quickly. See, here's a, here's a number of studies in 
50 studies on what happens in instruction when you have a high stakes accountability system that is pegged on one performance indicator and has a severe sanctions option uh, attached to it. Overall, as you can see here, overall what we see is a, is a deterioration in instructional quality not an improvement in instructional quality. So we are doing something wrong with the wrong kinds of incentive systems that highly motivate self-interest. That is, you know, if my school doesn't perform, my school will be closed. Therefore, I will make sure that I will perform on the test well. Now, what does this all have to say, um, perhaps, to you here in, Ch in, in, in Chile? I, like I said, have knowledge of the country that is exactly four and a half days uh, old uh, and therefore I cannot say much to it. But yesterday I had a conversation with a very, very inspiring group of educators. They were describing to me how they, they were a municipal system, how they have to compete with the private sector and you know they showed me the figures and those figures didn't look good for them. But in this case, one year it looked good for them. That's probably why I was there. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, so, so they showed, you know, so as a result, they said, SIMSA is the main game in town. We have to compete with the private subsidized system on SIMSA. And then as I was going around, this is what they said. And then, then I was going around, the principals told me, I visited some schools, yeah, you know, every five years, and now it's supposed to be every three years. Uh, and I couldn't figure out whether it's a national uh, policy or, or, uh, or local policy, the principals have to reapply for their jobs. And, it, and how the school is doing on the SIMSA is very, very important, a very important criterion on whether the contract gets renewed, number two. Then I had another conversation and I heard, oh, this district or this municipality also has a pay for performance system that pays half a monthly wage on the SIMSA results to all teachers in the system. That, to me, begins to smell like an incentive system that has distortion or that may, may, may uh, produce uh, crowding out and distortion effects. There I see self-interest going rampant. Okay? So I brought this up as a question and they said, oh, no, 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 this is not the way it is here because we have another incentive, which is we need to keep attendance up. In order to get attendance up, we have to appeal to a market that wants to see extracurricular activities, that want to see all kinds of wonderful things going on in the school, and we need to advertise these wonderful things. So we can't give up these wonderful things that American schools in the lower segment have all given up. PE is writing an essay about PE but not movement anymore. Um, art is doing a spelling test on the word art. Um, and so you know where I'm going. It's, it's absolutely amazing when you travel through these schools what they're doing. There are schools in Florida, I was, I was recently told I have, I have no more minutes left. There are schools in Florida, uh, a colleague of mine recently uh, studied, that for some reason the Florida test for elementary schools does not test writing. Okay, they don't. Okay, it's probably too expensive. Okay, so what happens? In some of these Florida schools, there is no more writing instruction. Now, that is truly a disservice to kids that need to function in the, in the modern world. We all know this, but it is done. So we need to ask ourselves, how can we, and this is the challenge that we have when we think about a pay for performance system, how can we mobilize self-interest and at the same time restrain it? Thank you. Bueno, vamos a dar algún tiempo pequeño para consultas. Entonces vamos a hacerlas a, al profesor eh, directamente, pero con micrófono. Entonces le va a pedir, aquí hay una primera palabra dada, pero le va a pedir que la haga con micrófono. Sobre este tema que como vemos es muy... Lagos, por acá está el profesor. Eh, profesor, le quiero hacer dos preguntas. La primera es una de carácter general. Y la segunda es un poco más eh, técnica, un poco relacionada con los modelos teóricos que usted utiliza en su investigación, que por lo demás me parecen extremadamente interesantes. Respecto de la, de la primera inquietud, eh, me gustaría saber su opinión respecto finalmente del modelo educativo que tiene nuestro país. 
Y se lo digo derechamente porque hace más de un año ya que nuestros estudiantes se están movilizando a las calles por eh, desafíos, pero por, también por demandas con las cuales yo personalmente empatizo y, y obviamente así también la dicen las encuestas, amplia mayoría de los chilenos simpatiza con las demandas que ellos tienen y que básicamente se traduce en poder avanzar en una educación pública amplia y gratuita. Porque el actual modelo, según nuestra perspectiva, seguramente es la causante de todos los problemas que tenemos de discriminación, de desigualdad y de falta de oportunidades que tiene nuestra sociedad. Ustedes, para ponerlo en contexto, citó de alguna manera como ejemplo el caso de Finlandia. Claramente cuando uno estudia, analiza, e incluso puede observar empíricamente lo que, lo que ocurre en Finlandia, a uno le da pena, pero también le da esperanza de que otro mundo es posible. ¿Ah? Porque cuando uno observa que finalmente el tema aquí tiene que ver con algo ideológico, de cambio ideológico, de cambio de paradigma ideológico, uno, uno podría decir finalmente, ¿será posible que nuestra sociedad chilena, nuestra clase política, pueda entender de que una educación pública gratuita no es una utopía, sino que también es posible? Quiero saber su opinión al respecto. Y la segunda es una opinión de carácter más técnico que se desprende a partir de uno de los enfoques que usted utiliza, que es la teoría de agencia. Efectivamente, es uno de los mejores enfoques para analizar los problemas de incentivo ¿ah? y de las relaciones que se producen entre principal y agente. Y particularmente, para ser muy concreto, quiero saber qué opina usted de los problemas de selección adversa, que es una de, de las hipótesis que tiene la teoría de agencia, que se producen en el ámbito del sector educacional. Que desde mi per perspectiva, sin haberlo estudiado científicamente, creo que también es uno de los grandes problemas que tenemos a propósito de la calidad educativa nuestra. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Vamos a juntar las otras dos preguntas y así el profesor va a poder terminar bien. Está usted y después está Ricardo y ahí terminamos. Después hacer la, la, la respuesta del profesor. Quería saber primero si puedo hacer la pregunta en inglés. Porque es posible. Está, escuché, está mejor para que todo el mundo pueda entender en castellano, lo están traduciendo, no okay. se preocupe. Eh, bueno, mi nombre es Max Barahona, soy estudiante de la Universidad de Montpellier en Francia. Uh, it's not working. No. Okay. No, it so I go ahead. Okay. So this is my question. I I was just saying I'm student, uh, a grad student in uh, Montpellier in France, and um, I, I full disclosure, I have an issue with um, incentives. I I used to be a believer in incentives, economic concept applied to social structures, but but actually through experience and now being an aspiring scholar, I I'm very critical. I have experience of teaching in universities who really are professional researchers, who are, um, they receive definitely the prestige, the, uh, the economic incentives, etc. But they really don't devote much time to teaching, which is done by lecturers, which receive a lower pay, and they basically go in a different track that sometimes, most of the time, goes nowhere. So you have, on one hand, and that's, that's I guess, my question, When you put it in this uh, binary relationship between, you know, we give somebody something so they do something that is good for all of us, if you look at the university system in the States, which I guess that it could be, like I said before, translating to other realities like ours, you have the self-interest of the tenure professors, which wa who want to actually be left alone so they can publish. The university has an invested interest in those professors publishing, so the universities are actually you know, show, I guess, that they are better universities, I guess, and in that way they can have more students coming to those universities. On the other hand, I don't know if actually the non-tenure professors, the lecturers, which according to what I remember is way more than half of the teaching done in the States. Okay. So, so, you know, and, and finally, how can we coordinate or, I guess, harmonize all those different interests that in my view, uh, I mean, It sounds all good, you know, in economics when you apply it to social structures, when you have organization groups, people, etc., that they have conflicting interests. How can you actually make it happen? Mm -hmm. okay. The last yeah. one here. Ah. Gracias. Eh, mi pregunta es eh, respecto a su, de su conclusión final, eh, que podríamos decir que aquí el, los incentivos no resultan o pueden no resultar. ¿eh? Eh, si, eso, si eso fundamentalmente se debe a un problema práctico fácilmente solucionable eh, mi interpretación de, de mi visualización clara del problema que hay con el CIMSE por ejemplo, premiar el CIMSE tiene que ver si es que el CIMSE 
no es el aprendizaje que queremos mover, sino que es una medida imperfecta del aprendizaje. O si los profesores pueden distorsionar el CIMSE, distorsionarlo, por ejemplo, excluyendo alumnos que lo rinden de, eh, eh, o, o, digamos, soplándoles, contándoles la respuesta a los niños eh, antes que la rindan. Pero eso, eso, teóricamente al menos, me parece, quería saber su opinión, eh, parece sol solucionable, parece abordable. Es, es, eh, ¿Hay que dar un paso más o está básicamente el tema de los incentivos? Eh, casi hay que hacerle una cruz y pensar en otra cosa. Gracias. Ok, thank you very much for, for, the, for the, the questions. Oh, I don't need this. Thank you, thank you very much for the question. So let me say something about the, the first question, uh, uh, Chile. I, I'm not familiar enough uh, with the, the situation other than what I read in the New York Times about your student movement. Uh, and that is um, clearly registered, but it's, I don't know enough about it. But I, I do want to share with you again um, a, a little uh, experience that, I, that, I, that I've, I've had now in the last, in four days. As an, as, a, as an external observer. One of the things that I find striking here, and I'm saying this as a personal experience, not at all as a scientist right now, is that this, in the four days, I have seen more, it's within the theme of, 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 of uh, common commitments and self-interest, I have seen more communal activity, more communal interaction in the two and a half, two days that I have been here than I have seen in the United States in the last two years. And at the same time, I have seen more talk about self-interest and management and testing and things like that here than I have heard in the United States in the last two years. <laughs> so, so I find this, uh, I talked with Miguel about it uh, this morning over breakfast, I find this a very, very interesting Um, interesting uh, uh, kind of disconnect and I, I would think that to the degree that this society brings together if I may say so again as a private person not a, as a researcher its national soul into what it really is it might actually be harmonious um, it might be more harmonious um, so I'm just throwing this out in terms of the the political class uh, I think the political class in many countries, the United States, but also Germany, um, most European countries now clearly think in the discourse of self-interest, new public management and the like. They do not uh, like the old system anymore and there are good reasons why they think this way. One of them, of course, is uh, that uh, the center is given new leverage with with new control instruments and incentives are one of those, those, uh, those instruments. It seems to me in order to, and I'm, I'm not, you could tell, I'm not rejecting these kinds of uh, measures, and this co goes to, to your question. Uh, even under older public management, even in a straightforward civil service kind of bureaucracy, there were incentives. Incentives are everywhere in all organizations. It's a matter of how we align them, how we allay them, what mix of incentives we, uh, we develop. And I believe that there can be a compromise between to the degree to which we mobilize self-interest and the degree to which we mobilize uh, commitments to students and, and commitments to the public good. But how this, how this compromise arises is, is really a matter, from my point of view, of an interaction between the political elites and a social movement because it is a social movement that has to bring to the political elite the concerns of the bottom. The top tends to, when we look at research, the top tends to think about the society in terms of control, and incentives are, are ways to control people on the bottom. The bottom thinks in terms of autonomy, self-determination, and the like, because they want to have this kind of autonomy Um, in, in their lives. So you have a disconnect and only social movements will communicate to the people who make decisions on the top uh, how to construct a compromise if a compromise is possible. Okay? So that's, that's uh, my very personal uh, answer to the, to the situation uh, that, 
that you, you brought up. I will skip the principal agent uh, question, and we can perhaps do this in, in, um, in, in afterwards. Um, the, uh, the, the question that, that, uh, that you asked, I'll come to the tenure later. Um, the question that you asked about, you know, um, uh, is it all a matter of practical, uh, practical um, you know, problem solving, so to speak. No, it is not. It is, of course, also a matter of politics. That is, what groups control what other groups? There is no question about that. Systems, organizational systems are set, set up in a particular way so that some groups have the opportunity to control other groups. We have to ask ourselves whether that control from one group serves the interest of students or not. What type of control and what kind of incentive systems optimally serves the interests of the students. That to me is not a political question, but it is a, is a question of design experiment. We really do not know. We do know that older public management systems work okay, but we also know that they have some drawbacks, that they have some inefficiencies, and it behooves us to experiment and to see if we can improve on the, the inefficiencies that, that, that these kinds of systems have. But we cannot do it without knowing where the limits are. That's what, what my talk was, was all about. We need to know that whenever we advocate policies or designs that, that uh, reinforce self-interest, we need to also be clear that we don't take away from the public commitments. In other words, we cannot have policies. Nowadays, we often see the situation that policymakers think, oh, by the way, principles as well. Oh, we just kind of, we ride, we ride the horse of self-interest, and we think that's it, right? And we get good education. No, we will not good, get, get education this way. We will get good education that for every horse that we send into the field that says high, high self-interest, we send two horses that say public commitment. That's how we're going to, but that is a design experiment. Whether that's going to be played this way, it's a matter of political power. Okay? On tenure, just let me say something, um, or you know, incentives, the incentive structure. I personally wrestle with this every day because I work in a research university in which publish and perish is the absolute game in town. And only to the degree that you publish will you, uh, will you uh, get your raises, your, your, your career, and the, and, and the like going. At the same time, I'm the director of a, a, a program that is called Leadership for Educational Equity, which brings uh, principals and lower level district administrators to the university in a four-year program to write their dissertation on a practical problem-solving project. This is enormous work. It costs so much effort on my part and I can count the number of articles that I have not written because of this work. <laughs> My colleagues always say to me, you are stupid, Rick. <laughs> and I am stupid by the incentive structure of this university. But I cannot stop doing it because I was an educator myself and I don't think that writing an article that is read by one and a half people <laughs> is as important as shaping the leadership of Northern California school districts, uh, and therefore I do it, and I don't care. And so I live this conflict between self-interested behavior and commitments to the common good and commitments to craft every day. Would I want to abandon the incentive structure? No, because I actually think that we have to have institutions that incentivize knowledge production. If we stop incentivizing knowledge production at the universities, we will have no institution left that does it. Because we have lots of private uh, outfits that generate knowledge for the consumers that really don't, you know, that don't think at the cutting edge. They can't because they have to answer to their customers. The universities are still in, with tenure and all those kinds of things, they still have the opportunity to develop knowledge, but it has to be incentivized. So I live with an incentive system that doesn't reward my work because I can see that that incentive system is something that benefits society. I happen to be on the margins of that incentive system and I have to live with it. <laughs> That's it. That's all.